Yeah. yeah. Indeed, snap, snap, snap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Triple chat. Yeah. Triple chat. Yeah. Triple chat. Probably one of those things where you never stop learning, you never stop growing, you never mm-hmm. stop taking little bits from other drag queens around you. That part. Mm. And that family recently got extended to the UK, yeah. just finished the UK season of Drag Race. What differences did you like about that season? Um, I was really into the fact that uh, they played up camp a lot more uh, than they do in, in the American series and that they're... The drag that was presented there was allowed to be a lot more forward in ways that ours hasn't been because our culture has grown around RuPaul's Drag Race, whereas British drag was its own very specific, unique thing. And RuPaul had to find a way to like fit her show into what they do. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And bring that to the masses. Yeah. And I couldn't understand half the shit they were saying. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I didn't understand the shit they were saying on season 11. Girl, the Drag Race UK. I was like, huh? <laughs> but it was really entertaining to watch. Can you give me an impression? Baga so chips can- is stunning. <laughs> Baga chips is claws. I fucking love that bitch. She is so incredible. I love her. She is just like that in real life too. She's it's so she entertaining. Well, I was like, uh-huh. I was like, 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 <laughs> oh my god Incredible. amazing so a lot of drag queens are creating their own music they're getting into music territory both of you have plastique you've got your track irresistible evie dollar store mm-hmm. do you think drag has its own genre these days i i mean it's kind of hard to say that it, it has its own genre because we're not necessarily doing anything that hasn't ever been done before it's just we are finally be, being given a voice drag queens I mean, aside from RuPaul, have never been allowed on the radios, on the TV, like, and so I think with RuPaul and RuPaul's Drag Race blowing up each year and getting bigger and bigger, we're finding spaces for ourselves in society that maybe weren't there before. And so as little, as little gay boys who dress up as our favorite pop stars and sing into our hairbrushes in the mirror, of course, I think it's a natural progression that some of us are going to find our way into a studio. Yeah, definitely. Mm. And how does it feel to see that representation on the radio, on TV? I mean, it's magical for me. I want, I want more drag, more drag in more places. More and more, yeah. I mean, growing up, I never had someone like me uh, to look up to on the TV. You know, being an Asian immigrant and doing this show, I just want to show, like, if you can be like me and move to America not knowing any English and somehow <laughs> made on television cross-dressing, anything is possible. That's so true. it's, it's my, yeah, it's mind-blowing and I'm very grateful. Yeah. For sure. And let's talk about the role of social media in drag because you mentioned that your social media blew up in particular. Do you think that plays more of a role both in drag in general but also RuPaul's Drag Race? Well, I think social media is how our younger generations are learning to get their stories out and keep ourselves from being erased, keep our voices from being silenced. So with drag becoming bigger and social media becoming bigger at the same time, it's really putting a spotlight on all these people who felt other, who felt queer, who felt out there and showing them that there's a whole community for you. Mm. And as far as it relates to drag race, I, I mean, Drag Race is just one more avenue to get your voice out. So we're seeing lots of people who've been working on social media make it to Drag Race. And lots of people uh, who came off of Drag Race learn how to speak this new language of social media Mm. to build their careers even further. Definitely. And reaching an audience that may have not ever stumbled upon this, yeah. Well, and that's the craziest part about it is we've been contributors to culture for as long as culture has existed. But as queer people, your voice gets wiped out and taken by somebody else, whether mm-hmm. that be your favorite pop star, whether that be like uh, somebody who just like buys the lyrics that you write. And for the first time in our history, mm-hmm. we're actually able to take credit for the artistry we've been putting in all along. Snap, snap, snap. Tell me about the importance of mental health in, dra- in the drag community because I feel like you obviously have a support network around you, but what about maybe people coming up in a small town or a rural community? If you don't feel like you have any other outlet, if you don't have any friends or family you can turn to, uh, to learn about yourself and to express how you're actually feeling and the thoughts that might actually scare some others, there's always a, p- a place on social media 
one of my uh, one of my drag daughters has started this support group for for queer performers who just need need some help need to vent and need to know that they're not alone mm. and i know there's so many other groups like that out and about in the world specifically for people who are uh struggling to find find a way to express that <laughs> mm, definitely and yeah and again i think representation is so important and that um, uh, social media is becoming more and more popular and RuPaul's Drag Race is becoming more and more popular and little kids now we just see like little kids coming to our show and <laughs> it's incredible because they watch RuPaul Drag Race and somehow they can find little things that they can relate to mm -hmm. in their own self that they can't really talk about to other people and when they come meet us they be like oh that once when you talk about your parents or when you have this condition that i can relate to so much i've never seen that before yeah so it just bring a whole community together and so yeah and also i think that you know behind the costumes and the wigs and you know the makeup there is a human under there there is a person under there oh Somehow. my god <laughs> she knows it <laughs> but genuinely, right now. <laughs> there's a relatability there. Well, and that's the that's if anything else, that's the one thing that I know I'm personally trying to stress within this year is I, I want people to have so much fun in their skin. I want them to see themselves in ways that they've never seen themselves before. But I don't want them to forget that all the people who are helping you or who you might look up to are still people too. Like mm. everyone is, everyone is still struggling. And at the end of the day, underneath all the makeup, we still have to deal with the own voice, with the voices in our own heads. And I mean, drag, drag has helped me learn how to heal some of the deeper traumas, but it's an ongoing process. Mm. And I feel like the more open we can be about where we are and uh, how we're feeling, then the more people we could possibly help. Absolutely. Mm. And where do you see drag evolving in the next 10 years? We are heading into 2020. Where do you see drag heading? I feel like drag is just going to be uh, everywhere and nowhere <laughs> in that the, the need for drag came from uh, society in general stomping out all of your individuality. And right now our society seems to be growing into a place where it accepts more and more of uh who you are and little bits of your identity so much so that I feel like in in 10 years the idea of a drag queen will be dead because we'll all be drag queens oh, I love that that's probably yeah that's probably the best answer because now you just see RuPaul on the cover of Vanity Fair yeah yeah like we're in magazines movies TV we're walking down the streets next to you I, I know little girls who are drag queens I know grown we're men down the Met Gala it's so, so like the more the more we're in this, you know, the less there will be of us. <laughs> <laughs>